she did share quite a bit of stuff and I'm really happy that you were able to get that interview uh, going which is awesome so that's cool I, I'm looking forward to posting that stuff up on Facebook yeah definitely well please uh, pardon me this morning everyone uh, I'm, I'm dealing with a pretty serious bout of vertigo this morning so I'm, I'm gonna be uh, unusually quiet I think today because I'm seeing multiple errands in front of me yeah it's not necessarily a bad thing but, uh, <laughs> nonetheless we do have a few stories that we want to get to definitely okay so which uh which I, one I should we start with this one um because this was this is us going back a few weeks to the story that was happening in greece uh we were talking about um uh, trans people but specifically trans women being rounded up in uh, thessaloniki uh, Greece prior to their uh, pride event and uh, it turns out this is connected to a much larger kind of process this thing called Operation Xenius Zeus that's taking place in uh, Greece and the information has been very scant as it's been kind of coming out to those of us in the States and around the world uh, and so it's been quite interesting I think trying to uh, how do I say um, legitimate for some people that this is taking place. Now, uh, as I've come to kind of research, uh, as I understand it, Operation Xenius Zeus is not just trans people, but specifically, quote, undesirable. So uh, that includes sex workers, people uh, su uh, suspected of being sex workers, including trans women, uh, homeless folks, um, uh, unemployed folks. Uh, throughout Greece that are being rounded up and put into these internment camps that apparently have over 5,000 people uh, interned currently. That's that's what I have access to so far, but um, the update that I specifically have is a, a, an official statement that was released on June 28th uh, from the, uh, the European Parliament's Intergroup on LGBT Rights. Uh, now, I, I myself uh, remain quite critical of any international global voice about LGBT folks, uh, particularly if it comes from out of a Western paradigm that assumes what LGBT looks like elsewhere. Um, but nonetheless, this is a more or less, quote, legitimate source that's now kind of tracking that this is taking place. Um, and they really uh, do the work of showing us that on, in August of 2012, 25 trans women were arrested and forcibly tested for HIV. And over the course of the following year, up to all, just a few weeks ago, those women were one at a time acquitted, uh, really guilty of no crime except being trans. Um, and so what's happening now is allegedly uh, trans women are continuing to be rounded up right now by the Greek government. Uh, so I just really wanted to put this out there as an official source that's kind of out there that's now kind of documenting that something is going on in Greece. It's making its way outside of blogs and more into this legitimate uh, space of knowledge. If that's something that you're more into is more this legitimate sources or whatnot. Uh, I don't know if you had anything to add to that at all about what's going on in Greece at all or any thoughts. Well, it's, it's absolutely frightening, you know, that anybody can just be picked up on the street based off their looks and forced to take an HIV test. It says a lot about how, um, you know, they're regulating health there and how they're they're kind of navigating that by just Well, sexuality, profiling. I mean, they're, the very thought that apparently if someone looks like or is a trans person, that by default, A, that they're somehow a sex worker, and B, that that person has HIV. Which right, this is kind of centered around the fear of HIV. I'm pr that's pretty much correct, right? Well, I think that it's using HIV as a marker to kind of legitimate uh, hate against certain groups of people. So HIV becomes a scapegoat to kind of justify the ridicule or persecution of certain groups of people. Yeah, I think it also mentioned that one of there was a the lawyer was detained as well. The a trans well, there, I, lawyer. I, yeah, one, yeah. There was a, a lawyer for one of these trans women. Uh, we don't know whether or not she was trans, but the very fact that she showed up to defend her client, uh, she was then arrested. Yeah, it just goes to show how. Um, Sneaky, this is kind of becoming, they're really avoiding. Yeah, I mean, we're slowly getting this information out, and it's, it's something that uh, I know that I'm interested in tracking uh, what's going on and trying to get more information out. And we'll definitely keep bringing some of that information to you, but overall, it's it's quite crazy. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how else to describe it, really. Gosh, I mean, it's it's really interesting because I, I mean, you, you feel uncomfortable already <laughs> as a trans person, you know, walking out. 
and just knowing that that uh, there's a risk of just instantly being just picked up off the street and forced to take an HIV test is just absolutely I can't even imagine the fear of being trans in Greece right now. Well, yeah, and you know, and this actually reminds me of something because um, I had a, uh, a a friend who I posted uh, one of these stories or a comment like this up on fa my personal Facebook. Uh, and, and the response was what I would say um, uh, kind of a typical response, a very American response of, oh, that happens elsewhere but not here in America because we're so progressive and we treat trans people well here in the States. And, you know, and, and the response kind of, in one way, it took me by surprise and then in another way it made me really realize how this story, if we're not careful about how we report it, we end up kind of supporting or uh, yeah, supporting the notion that we somehow in America treat our homeless, unemployed, uh, trans people and sex workers with some sort of dignity, and that's not true. Uh, these are the same uh, already vulnerable populations that are harassed by uh, the, the, the police state that are picked up routinely, that are arrested, that are put into court systems. This right? is a yeah. This is a great point that you're making. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that I, it, it's not that it's elsewhere. It's, it, this is a global phenomenon. This is how marginal groups are treated everywhere. I think the difference is that in Greece, there's allegedly uh, a formal program in place, this Operation Xenia Zeus, sure. that kind of formally justifies with the list what bodies we are going to round up. And that's what becomes interesting. Like, that's the only difference. We have that same program here, we just call it everyday life, and we justify it because we don't have a formal protocol of this is who, I mean, it's called profiling, but because we don't have a formal protocol in place, uh, it's easier for maybe a, a police officer or somebody accusing somebody else of saying, oh, no, 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 they individually are acting peculiar. Sure. When that's never the case, it's a larger system that says these are populations that we need to be weary of. Homeless people, unemployed people, uh, trans immigrants, people, people, immigrants of color, people of color, right. oh, and immigrants. I'm sorry, in Greece, also uh, huge populations being rounded up are immigrants as well in this. Right. Uh, protect, particularly uh, black immigrants uh, in Greece that are being uh, marked in terms of, oh, you don't belong here. Exactly. Um, and so there's, so I, I want to be careful that we're not, we're not saying this story about something happening in Greece as if to say it doesn't happen here. I think that I think you're making a point definitely and that's important to understand so that we're not really dismissing this as an other thing that happens elsewhere you know because it's important to recognize what is still happening around us that's absolutely just as frightening yeah. um, we have a couple stories but I'm actually going to jump in here real quick and I'm going to suggest that we uh, exert the halfway mark here Play some play. music. Well, I would like to play one song by uh, the Indigo Girls. The reason why I want to play this song, uh, did you want to say something about why the Indigo Girls, why we decided on that? I mean, yeah, they've been resisting Mishfest. Which um, is? Which is a, uh, a festival <laughs> <laughs> that is exclusively for um, women born women, uh, female born females. We should talk about this eventually. It's um, we could talk about it a little bit today. I mean, we could we could definitely talk about this. I mean, so so, so the wish, uh, the Michigan Women's Fest uh, is as as Aria is saying a musical festival uh, that has historically excluded transgender people. Uh, specifically, trans women have really had a hard time getting into and participating in this space. Um, and part of the problem is that you have the executive director who's saying, no, 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 we don't exclude trans people. They're just silly. It's a don't ask, don't tell policy is what they really have in place. When we know that's really also not the case because there's been stories upon stories of trans women kicked out after being exposed, quite literally, for not being uh, women born women, whatever it is that that's supposed to be. Yeah, well, and, uh, yes, and the reason why we chose the Indigo Girls is because this was, I, it was, I think this year or it was last year, it, it was basically their final performance because their contract was up with Mishfest, and they stopped and did not renew their contract because of the exclusionary practices at the Mishfest. Right. 
<laughs> right. Right. Well, let's let's get to their song. Okay. Let's hear some Indigo Girls. Uh, and this song is we chose uh, closer to find, closer to find, closer to find. Okay, that was the Indigo Girls. So you mentioned wanting to play something. Uh, sure. Um, well, yes, that was Indigo Girls. Closer to find. Uh, there's a video that's been circulating uh, online lately. Uh, featuring Dustin Hoffman, uh, and he's talking about his role as Tootsie, uh, which is a quote-unquote classic film from the 80s uh, that I haven't seen in many years. And I haven't seen that at all. Oh, you haven't? Okay. No, I better check that out. <laughs> uh, so I, 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 I extracted the audio uh, from this video, and I wanted to just play, it's a three-minute clip of Dustin Hoffman talking about uh, getting ready, I suppose you could say, preparing for the role of Tootsie, and this revelation that he kind of experienced that women have already always known, but apparently it takes Dustin Hoffman, a man, experiencing this for people to finally go, oh, okay, so that's what's going on. So before we kind of get open up to this criticism, uh, we're just going to go ahead and play this three-minute clip of Dustin Hoffman uh, talking about his experience uh, real quick. And then maybe later uh, I can show Arya the movie Tootsie. Murray Shiskel, who has been my dear friend for over 30 years, uh, kicked off Tootsie with the thought of how would you be different if you had been born a woman? It was a, in a conversation we had one time. Not what does it feel like to be a woman, because all sexes have asked themselves the question, what does it feel like to be what would it feel like to be the opposite sex? But the, his question was different. If you, if you were born a woman, how would you be different? So that kicked off, which is a, it would take too long to answer how we then got involved in Tootsie for, for about two years before we even got a director, just working on different drafts of the script. But I did go to Columbia and I asked them if they would spend the money to do makeup tests so that I could look like a woman. And if I couldn't look like a woman, they would agree not to make the movie. And they said, what do you mean? And I just somehow intuitively felt that unless I could walk down the streets of New York and not have uh, dressed as a woman and not have people turn and say, who's that guy in drag? Or turn for any reason, that you know, who's that freak? If, unless I could do that, I didn't want to make the film. I didn't want the audience to suspend their their, 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 their believability. When we got to that point and looked at it on screen, I was shocked that I wasn't more attractive. And uh, I said, now you have me looking like a woman, now make me a beautiful woman. Because I thought I should be beautiful. I, if I was going to be a woman, I would want to be as beautiful as possible. And they said to me, that's as good as it gets. Uh, that's as as beautiful as we can get you, <laughs> Charlie. And it was at that moment that I had a, an epiphany, and I went home and started crying, uh, talking to my wife. And I said, I have to make this picture. And she said, why? And I said, because I think I'm an interesting woman when I look at myself on screen. And I know that if I met myself at a party, I would never talk to her that character because she doesn't fulfill physically the demands that we're brought up to think we have, that women have to have in order for us to ask them out. She says, what are you saying? And I said, there's a, too many interesting women. I have, I have, I, I have not had the experience to know in this life because I have been brainwashed and that was never a comedy for me. All right, that was that was fascinating. It was really interesting. I I never heard that before. Yeah, so I mean it's 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 Dustin Hoffman talking about um, preparing for this role of Tootsie. Okay. Wow, no. I definitely want to go see that movie. Yeah, where he plays a woman and um seems so emotionally invested. 
it's definitely really interesting. Yeah, and part of like what his observations are is Yeah. Yeah, it, he's he's making all of these really interesting observations about um you know, what he thinks a woman should look like, what his standards of beauty are. He's walking down the street, he's wanting to pass, and if you don't pass, he's saying that people are going to think he's a freak. It's, um... What is, yeah, and, and what he's really, I, I mean, what I get out of this, what he's highlighting is that he ends up kind of experiencing how incredibly um, binary our understanding of what a woman and a man is, are supposed to look like, um, as opposed to a variation of what women can look like and, in fact, do look like, right? So when he saw himself as Tootsie, at first glance, he didn't see himself as a woman because she wasn't, quote, beautiful enough, right? Yeah, according, according to some cisgender standard exactly. of what looks like, right? Yeah. So I, I, I think that his interview, or this, this reflection, I don't know if it's really an interview, it's more like a reflection of his. I think it's telling for some reasons, but in some ways I'm kind of like, yeah. <laughs> Women know this. Women have to deal with this all the time, these beauty standards of uh, what a beautiful enough woman looks like. Or it, so, you. you're right. So there is something offensive about this, about this interview that we're listening to, is this man, you know, growing and evolving, you know, from, because he's finally realizing the, the standards that are set up, right, these misogynistic standards. Do you think that... Do you think that that's something that uh, trans I mean, women deal with? Yeah, I mean that whole process itself. Like, I also don't want to completely dismiss him. Like, I want to be critical, of course, and see. Like, no, I don't. Yeah. I don't want to dismiss him. He, you know, he he invested himself in this role, and he he played the role fine. Probably, I haven't seen the movie. I mean, he did, he got through it. I'm sure <laughs> that's the whole deal. He got through it, and he can return to his life. But. I, and it's, and it's great, and, and it's not really accusing any specific person, which is not what I want to do. I'm not mad at Dustin Hoffman, right? right. This isn't about, about Dustin Hoffman. Um, it's, it's unfortunate that we have trans women walking down the street, and they're seen as freaks. You know, I, I'm sure a lot of people think that of me when they, when they look at me, so it's almost hard to listen to things like this, because... I'm, I'm not trying to disguise myself. I'm not putting on a costume. But do you think that part of being trans based on this system, I feel like there, there tends to be this kind of pressure, two different, uh, off the top of my head, two paths, I guess, can unfold. One is kind of uh, engaging in the, a politic of what we might call cis supremacy where there is a certain type of beauty and that's defined by normative gendered people, non-trans exactly. people, okay. or learning how to beautify and empower the trans body as it looks, no matter how that person's trans body looks, right? That exactly. This is and a that's, way of being man or this is a way of being woman. That would be the, you know, the kind of trans feminist qualities that we want to, that we want to look at. And when Benny says cisgender or cis, we're talking about non-transgender people. Right, right, which, I mean, it's still, still a relatively newer term that's uh, increasingly being brought into, I think, more activist uh, and everyday spaces. Right, yeah, so we're talking about, um, you know, standards that have been set up for, for non-trans people, that trans people are, are, you know, such as myself, trying to fit into, and it's definitely... Uh, it's definitely really interesting to to continue thinking about you know when when uh, when you have someone like Dustin Hoffman or whatever kind of entering that space temporarily and making all of these judgment calls um, you kind of get to hear what, what you know people are really thinking maybe about yeah. trans women or, or even trans men maybe this, you know this doesn't just go for women there's standards set for men as well but um, these standards in general, right, they're, I mean, they're set up to, to harm definitely trans people uh, or, you know, just to expose those who are not blending into that, that system that's set up. But anyway, we definitely have a, a few other stories to look at, a, a couple others, if we don't mind oh, moving please, on. Please, please. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So these are, 
I mean, these are kind of shocking stories. I mean, we can talk about a few things here. Um, I have an article here that that is titled, Should Trans People Have to Disclose that Their Birth Gender Before Engaging in Sexual Activity with Another Person? And a lot of people, I think, and I, definitely I think a lot of cisgender people might think, well, of course, because, you know, you can accept and, and love your trans neighbor, but when it comes to being intimate, I think people want to know everything about the person they're being intimate with. Yet, that doesn't always happen. So trans people are, are now being put kind of under the microscope when it comes to intimacy and disclosure, of course, because we have, you know, there's stories where there's been uh, people engaging in, sexually, in sexual activity with a trans person and finding out they're trans and, you know, uh, whatever ensues later, which is usually an attack. The trans person is is attacked, um, brutally murdered, br brutally murdered. um, yeah, you know, they, tons, tons of things could happen, so there's, there's all sorts of, of stuff going around, but, uh, you know, there's no choice that's going to be made in the UK for the trans person. Is this where the story is taking place? This is where the story lies, this article is from the UK, and, the, you know, this happens here, of course. But there is a law now in the, in the in the UK. It is, as far as I'm I'm concerned, I'm sure we'll we'll come back to this. But it is now illegal for a trans person to not disclose their genitalia, right? So they're they're specifically talking about the genitalia the person has before engaging in intimacy, and it's which really just places the impetus and blame on the trans person, again, the marginal location, as opposed to the other party that really is the one that has the problem. Yeah, so, so really, we're, this yeah. is victim blaming. So you right. can be sent to prison for it, and some people already have been, and that's the frightening part about this. These, I mean, these stories are always frightening when you see what's happening to trans people that doesn't happen to to others, um, it's really, it's really scary. That is, that's terrifying, and it makes me think, like, on one end, it, you, you, you disclose, and then you run the risk of being abused or mur murdered. You don't disclose, and then you go to prison. What? Right, you, you know, <laughs> in disclosure, you know, disclosing your transgender identity, it, you know, it's, one, it's it's dangerous. It's so dangerous, and it could it could really end in in a terrible terrible way. And and there's many ways to go about you know meeting someone and such, and and you know revealing that information that you're transgender. Um, but you see that the point is is that it's not really my business how how someone's meeting someone. I I'm not going to be analyzing people's relationships and how and how they engage themselves um, it's it's just frightening that uh, the UK is now is now making it a crime to not disclose your sex so this is really what this is is a direct attack on transgender individuals you know in their lives in our lives trying to exist um, and and mediating relationships, so it's really, it's really kind of frightening. And uh, to add, to add one more dynamic to this as well, I mean, the, the disclosure of one's, the disclosure of one's uh, genitals, and it being particularly the impetus of trans people to do so, assumes that people who are uh, read as or understood as cisgender somehow have normative genitals that do not need to be disclosed as well. And so this also kind of excludes an entire population of intersex uh, individuals as well that on one way may be read as on the outside or understood on the outside as one particular gender. And then maybe those uh, genitals don't match up in any particular capacity that matches the current system that creates a you're either this or this. Uh, and, and yeah, that's a great point, and you know the article spoke about that as well. So that's that's just a great point to bring up in general. And it's just, I mean, we're we're just discussing we're just discussing our opinions, but this is basically what's happening in in the UK right now against trans people is that they can't really have 
you know, a sexual experience without thinking twice, right? It kind of is totally disrupting their lives, really. It's, it's really keeping them in fear. Um, and it's giving so much control over to non-transgender people who, in general, have a great amount of control over our bodies anyway. I mean, we'd love to hear your opinion and posting a discussion, perhaps even on Facebook.com uh, forward slash beyond the binary would be helpful. Uh, the question being at the top of the article here, which is, uh, should one disclose their uh, trans identity or genitals prior to sexual contact? Uh, I think that's an interesting dialogue, a dialogue that's an important dialogue that really forces us to talk about some of the particular body parts, the anatomy, the genitals, that non-trans people find so important for defining trans people. It always comes back down to the genitals about, well, what does it look like, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, this could, this could come in, in so many different shades of, of offensive, you know? Yeah. It, it comes to... It comes down to satisfaction with the person, you know, I guess who, whoever, you know, this isn't just trans people, it's just you have to disclose your body parts. I mean, this could come down to whether or not someone is satisfied at all with the way that a body part looks. Mm -hmm. They could easily say that this wasn't consensual. I mean, this is why this, this, this story is so ludicrous to, to see in, in here, and this is actually happening, it's because this really comes down to you, you know, we're, we're kind of looking into people's lives and making sure that they're disclosing certain information that really is, uh, isn't something that should, we should be really even talking about. Right? Well, I, I think that this is, I mean, this brings us to our final story, and the segue particularly uh, revolves around this notion of uh, genitals. And uh, I think, number one, that one of the number one responses on uh, checklists about being an ally to trans people or questions not to even ask trans people are regarding genitals, right? Like, can I see it? Uh, and this, what do you actually have? Right, what are right. you really... It's... I mean, you can hear us. We're, we're feeling very sarcastic right now because yeah. this isn't something we're not used to. Um, right. We've spoken about... Disclosure is a, definitely a topic and well, in the trans community. And, and it, disclosure itself, particularly on genitals, still doesn't actually tell anything. It doesn't. It doesn't tell anything. And, and Particularly when genitals don't always line up with the gender identity of the person that we presume to be looking at, right? That there's all right. kinds of variations. Right. But this doesn't, I mean, this doesn't baffle people, right? Like, a, right. a lot of people are just like, well, I'd want to know. Yeah. I'd want to know if the person is transgender or has a history of... About, yeah, I want to know their biological history, I want to know all of that, and we're quick to, to make these judgments, but it, we can't really regulate sexual intimacy in that way. I mean, that's, that's the frightening thing, is that it's such an invasion of privacy, it's, mm -hmm. it's humiliating, it's, it's frightening. Um, and this, you know, this comes down to basic exclo uh, disclosure, if we're going to talk about that. I'm, a part of me is totally... Uh, on, on the side of disclosing, but I, I think that comes down to the individual, and, and this doesn't have to do with genitalia, but more so just saying, I'm transgender. Um, I, I think that's something that you should be proud of. We were talking a bit about trans feminism. Um, but, I mean, this, this is my opinion, right? This isn't, right. I can't right. make, I can't speak for all trans people. But, but your version people. of disclosing about right. being proud of being trans is different than I'm disclosing so that you don't get freaked out. Like, yeah. there's two different, right, like, like especially if it's a court mandated or legislated that you must disclose this to people because you might scare them, is much different than, I'm trans, if you don't like it, get out of here. Yeah. Right, and I think that those are two different approaches. That's uh, a good point, and, oh my gosh. Okay, well, let's, can we move on to our last story? Yeah, let's go do that. This, and we're talking, of course, we're focused on, on how trans people's, uh, Trans people's bodies are, are being explored, uh, you know, and they're on they're on display. Um, nothing new. Nothing new for cisgender folks to pry and poke at, um, which happens. I mean, we're just being honest. Uh, this article is from the Trans Advocate, and um, it's titled "Gawking at Trans Kids' Genitalia Is Being Considered 
Freedom of speech, says the Philly Police Department in Philadelphia. So this, <laughs> this is a story, sadly, about a minor whose, whose body was investigated by uh, someone they looked up to. It, it seems to be a reporter of some sort that was doing a story on trans, uh, possi you know, potentially doing a story on what it means to be transgender. This happens a lot. There's, there's tons of those out there nowadays. But the, the uh, trans person in question, the minor, was forced to remove their clothing, not really forced per se maybe, but persuaded, coaxed into removing their clothing so that the reporter could get a good look at uh, what transgender genitals look like. Well, well, I mean, specifically, from what I understood, was that the reporter was talking this uh, trans guy into uh, seeing how he gets injections, uh, whether it's testosterone or it uh, could be some other procedure. It, right. Getting some sort of, basically, like a, 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 a surgery of sorts, but not really a surgery. Uh, and in the process of this, while the trans guy was naked, uh, this reporter says, hey, can you turn around so I can look at it? Referring to the genitals and starts exploring in detail in this article, uh, she, and when I say she, I'm talking about the reporter here. Um, was it a female? Yeah, reporter. the reporter, yeah. In fact, there's a, there, there's a description that's put in this article with all the expletives taken out. And the censored parts are referring to the ways that uh, the language that if used in relation to a 15-year-old cisgender person uh, as opposed to this 15-year-old trans guy, a 15-year-old uh, cisgender person, that, that reporter would have been put in jail. That a reporter, that a person cannot look at, poke and pry at, and then talk about in detail the genitals of a 15-year-old, that that's illegal. But yet, because this 15-year-old is a transgender person, it's done out of freedom of speech for the reporter. And the reporter, as a result, effectively gets away with being able to talk this way openly about transgender youth. Now, there's a whole other politic about age of consent that uh, I can go on a whole rant about, and I don't want to do that here, at least not now in this, this story. But I really want to focus on this double standard that gets set up between a reporter who's able to look at this child uh, somewhere between the ages of 15 and 18 to describe these genitals. The reporter actually says that the, 50, or that the trans guy identified as 18 but did not believe. In fact, the reporter admittedly says that she's attracted two to three years from his response. So acknowledging that this person's probably a minor and yet is still going to go into detail describing what these genitals look like. And yet, it's okay in this context. Uh, yeah, the Philadelphia. And it's not even looked at in two ways by people that were reading this. Exactly, the police department is is calling it freedom of speech, and um, so that's those are you know those are our stories for today. And of course, our Facebook uh, is facebook.com forward slash beyond the binary. Tell us what uh, you thought of the show today. Yes. And of course, uh, we'll put links up of you know you can find Sybil Lamb's artwork, which I I really really would love to, if I can, persuade you or seduce you into looking at her art. It's absolutely beautiful. All right, have a great week. We're going to leave you with a song by The Clicks. Uh, uh, this song is Dirty King, uh, The Clicks.